Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the spiritual experiences of a lifelong monk. Uh, please kindly mute. Everyone remain muted in, until there is the time for Q&A. If you're to ask a question, please stay on mute. Thank you. So this is our second episode in the series, and it is our second season. We did this last year with our esteemed speaker, Sachinandana Swami, as well. This is a part of our Remembering Who We Are weekly gathering to remember that we are the soul, not the body, not the mind, not the ego, and to make spiritual advancement by identifying with who we actually are. There's nobody better to help us do that than Sachinandana Swami, who has dedicated his entire life to doing so. He has been a monk for more than 50 years and has been sharing his realizations, his experiences, his teachings all around the world. Yes. Oh. Kindly mute. Thank you. He is no. with us today from Germany, and we have people here in this community from around the world. We warmly welcome you. And the format of this program is that we will have about 45 minutes of hearing an experience of his, a spiritual experience that impacted him and changed him in some way that he will then share the wealth for us to gain from so that we can have our own spiritual experiences. And then we will have whatever remaining time is there for any questions that come up. We will officially be closing the program at the top of the hour, that's 1 p.m. Eastern time. And then Sachinandana Swami, uh, if he's able, he will stay with us for questions further questions. So you please also stay with us and send your questions to Michael by direct message. He'll be fielding the questions. Michael Sloyer is there. Send him all questions by direct message. And then we will call upon you to ask your question. We have three pillars of the culture that will make this the most impactful experience for everyone here. And we ask that we agree to these three pillars, which are one, your full-hearted participation. Please give your undivided attention and be with your hearts in that receptive mood. It makes all the difference. And keep your video on as far as possible. That also makes a big difference in our level of presence and in seeing each other and being together as a community. Your respect is the second pillar. That is, we are trying to create a safe and sacred space here together. And there are very, very sacred teachings that will be communicated to us by the grace of Sachinandana Swami. Let us be as respectful as possible. And lastly, determination, that we want to take these teachings with us. We don't want them to be an intellectual exercise. We don't want them to be a feel-good experience. We want them to be something that changes us in a similar spirit as they've changed him. So your full-hearted participation, your respect, and your determination are required. Is everybody on board? Thank you very much. So just before we have Sachinandana Swami as our uh, guest speaker, who is the reason we're here today, um, he had asked me to share a word about the previous session, the previous episode that he did, where in the Q&A, there was a lot of depth that came out that was actually, it felt like it was drawn out very organically in a beautiful way. There was a flow of deepening insights so the first thing that I, I have to ask of you is, please, if you were not able to stay for the Q&A last time, go and watch it. You will not regret it. <laughs> the link is here. I'm just going to put in the chat. And this has actually all of the episodes from last year and last week. So season one and season two, episode one, it's all here. 
and the Q and A was very impactful. One thing that came out was how uh, Sachinandana Swami's experience, we can write it off, we can dismiss it very easily as, well, it's wishful thinking, or your, your mind makes it real, but it's not real objectively. Or there are so many different ways that we can cheapen and make it casual. But there are actual measures of what is a genuine spiritual experience. There has to be a direct experience he had shared with us where we feel touched by divinity and it's fundamentally different from anything else in our prior experience. This is like a scientific validation of spiritual experience. And then it leads to something else. It leads to virakti, which is detachment detachment from material life. So it orients us more towards the soul and away from our material paradigm and the selfish longings that we carry with us. So a direct experience, a feeling of being touched by divinity and a detachment from that which is not divine, that which has nothing to do with the soul those are measures. And this is extremely valuable for our own lives, for our own measure, and also so that we come in with the level of respect, full-heartedness, and determination to gain. So there's much more that can be said. I will leave it at that because I really am anxious to hear from Sachinandana Swami, but please do check out the Q&A. And now, over to you. Thank you so much for being with us. We're very, very grateful. So uh, let me ask first of all to see if I'm audible. Can you all hear me? Yes, good. Mm. Uh, welcome to episode two in our second season on spiritual experiences of a lifelong monk. Um, it is my desire in talking about uh, these uh, personal experiences that I will perhaps motivate you to uh, go into a space where you can also make such experiences. Very often spiritual experiences happen when we uh, let go of our control over our life and open up to a higher influence, to a higher, uh, to a higher working, you could say. And uh, this happens on pilgrimages, when we go to a new place, where we really need to orient ourselves anew. It happens during spiritual practice, when we let go and uh, make space for divine experiences. Uh, it can happen during uh, a sacred reading, uh, but more than anything, it happens in a genuine exchange with spiritually minded and advanced people. Uh, all of a sudden, we see life through their lens. All of a sudden, we are motivated to try something which they have done. Uh, all of a sudden, our weak heart gets strength to uh, act outside the box. Uh, today I will be sharing with you um, two spiritual experiences that have been very impactful in my uh, life. Uh, and uh, because um, uh, there is this question which I had at the beginning of these experiences and during these experiences I will start with my question. My question always has been what is a genuine spiritual experience and, and how to uh, make it? Mm, uh, mm, uh, there is, uh, uh, today I will give you four uh, uh, 
definitions by which I checked what happened to me and was convinced, yes, that's a genuine spiritual experience. It, it first of all, <laughs> and that makes such a, a program difficult, it is, uh, it defies expression. It, it means it needs to be experienced by a person himself. He can't get it uh, or get the knowledge of it by hearing from one, uh, from another person. Because uh, a genuine spiritual experience simply cannot be grasped by the intellect. It is, it has what is called in English ineffability. Uh, the next uh, thing is it's noetic. Noesis is a Greek word which means an inner knowing, uh, a direct knowing, uh, an intuition, uh, uh, something like an implicit understanding. It's like when you, when you just uh, know in your life, yeah, that's true, that's so true, that's truer than everything else. Uh, these revelations or illuminations, in other words, carry an authority of their own, a compelling sense that this experience feels so uh, real. Um, and you know, you were allowed to dive into something that, again, the intellect uh, has no access to. Uh, usually genuine spiritual experiences are of a transition nature, that is, you can't maintain them as long as you are uh, in this body and uh, working with this mind for, for long mm, before they fade away in the daylight of our ordinary experience. Uh, it, and the last is a genuine spiritual experience has the nature that it happens to you. You don't make it happen. Uh, there is a type of passivity uh, there, or as uh, some spiritualists like to say, you become a receiver, um, not an achiever. Uh, you uh, capture the experience in the bowl of your heart uh, uh, somehow. Uh, but uh, uh, yes, there may be spiritual exercises which you do, breathing for instance, or in my tradition it's chanting mantras. Um, there may be uh, certain bodily performances like sitting straight, focusing your attention and so on. Uh, but these things in themselves do not make the spiritual experience. Um, they may uh, bring you into an area of receptivity, uh, but uh, it's really when you make the spiritual experience that you feel you have been seized or <laughs> Oh, yes, seized is a good way. You have been uh, caught by a superior power and for the time of the experience you were held in the hands of that superior power. So, um, first of all, ineffability, uh, it defies expre expression by words, noetic, um, it's an inner knowledge uh, and transition to such an experience usually is only there for a short time, but you remember it. And finally, uh, as there is a type of pass, uh, passivity that is you're the receiver and not the one who makes it happen. Enough theory! <laughs> I uh, needed to say this, however, so that when you hear um, what I will tell you now, uh, you are a little bit prepared and you can uh, put it perhaps into some, uh, put a frame around it and so on. It was in the year 2001 
Mm, it could be also 2000. I'm not so good in, in counting years. Uh, where I had an experience how the divine can enter this world and work into this work in this world almost like a flash of lightning which has a lot of electricity can enter into a metal uh, conductor and then enter the the earth so the divine appearance into this world usually or, or sometimes sometimes happens through a medium like the lightning which uh, was uh, uh, working through the co conductor the lightning conductor uh, in my case the medium were parents <laughs> let me explain uh, in that year I uh, was uh, living in an abundant castle near the sacred mountain Govardhan. I still remember this castle had become uh, the property of monkeys. There was one monkey boss and he had uh, his ministers under him and uh, his uh, a large family of females and we lived together and he was really not happy with me having come there. Most of the time I needed to lock myself into the rooms, into one little room uh, and sometimes I would hear him grunting before the room, what are you doing here? Uh, <laughs> this is my castle. <laughs> So uh, after some time, however, um, we became friends because I learned to respect his territory uh, and I learned to also give him every day two bananas. And uh, that was our, uh, we didn't have a contract, but uh, that was our understanding. As long as I gave him the bananas, he would tolerate me, although initially he was very, um, let us say, dismissive of me. Mm, uh, so mm, I began to settle in this environment and after two weeks I uh, was accepted and I could walk freely amongst the monkeys. They understood I used this room and they roost used the rest of the castle and I gave their leader two bananas a day. There was no problem with the monkey, but there was soon another problem came. The problem with the mind. Some spiritualists call it the monkey mind. <laughs> it jumps during spiritual practices. It swings from one subject to another like a monkey. It sometimes uh, uh, dashes mm, to uh, another subject. Um, it is sometimes afraid and sometimes threatening. Uh, the mind has its has a life of its own, and somehow or other, and I'm yet to find out the reason. My mind was particularly active in that old castle, and I became very, uh, let us say. I could no, not come to this level of stillness in my mind from where you can dive deep and uh, see what is on the bottom. But, uh, it was very troublesome and soon my spiritual practice became dry, arid, uh, so that one day I asked the question. I'm chanting all these mantras, but are you hearing? Are you receiving? If there is a God who is pleased by my spiritual practices, may he show himself. May he give me a sign. I don't think I can go on much longer without a sign. I remember I had seen an old movie by 
Saint Francis of Assisi, who um, came the last period of his life to this position where he uh, uh, felt, I have given my life to you, but you have not yet shown yourself to me. And I remember that that scene in the movie where Saint Francis uh, asked, uh, uh, just calls, calls out, show yourself, show yourself to me. It was very nicely played by the actor. It was really moving and I uh, had this image uh, of Saint Francis in my mind because I could identify so much with it. Uh, please, one little sign, something uh, that shows that you are there and that you care. Uh, I didn't receive an answer and uh, therefore decided one day to make the test. I got on a bicycle, and I drove around the sacred mountain and found myself in uh, isolated uh, place uh, where there were no pilgrims. And I settled in, in this place under a nice shady tree and I started to do my mantra meditation. And uh, from time to time I was uh, just uh, sending a silent prayer, uh, show yourself, give a sign, one sign, please. Nothing happened. What happened was the, the dead hour happened. What is that? In India, and I believe also in the West, monks know that at the time between 12 and 2 o'clock, so is usually the hour when one becomes a little tired, one has gotten up early and the uh, sun is high up and uh, even in the West we feel a little bit drained of energy. Um, and in, the, in India where it can be very, very hot, disturbingly hot, uh, this is called the dead hours. Uh, you know, people usually eat a little, not too much, and then they take a rest during this time. So I, I, became, I came into this dead hour and I went numb. I just somehow uh, I, I meditated and then from time to time I lost this, the, the chain or the string of my meditations and uh, dozed off to catch it. It was a dry uh, uh, period during a dry spur to practice by a dry old man. <laughs> That's how I remember it. I was not so old, but I felt as if I had aged 100 years uh, all of a sudden. I heard loud screeching and I came out of this dull state with a start. And the screeching continued, yes, really loud, really loud. I looked around for, for, for what is the sound? Uh, and I saw something that startled me to the bones. I saw a black cobra trying to rush towards me to give me the cobra bite. I had heard that that year two of my monk friends from India had uh, uh, been bitten by cobra and one was not fast enough to cut the bite out of the leg. Uh, one of them had succumbed to, to dead. Death. So I see this cobra just making its uh, uh, way towards me and its, its intent clearly menacing. But at the same time, I see three or four small 
fragile parrots diving with loud screeching uh, to the cobra, almost like uh, uh, fighter aircrafts or bombers, you call them in England, uh, and attacking that cobra with their talons. They attacked the, the head area, they attacked all over, and they really knew what they were doing. They were going high and then vroom, coming down uh, in an almost a, a strategically planned uh, fighting. Now, my dear everyone, parrots never fight with cobras. You find these little, they're called mungos in, in German language. Uh, is it mongoose? Maybe mongoose in English mongoose. language? Mongoose. Yes, mongoose. Uh, uh, many households have uh, these mongoose on iron ch small iron chains in the household uh, just to protect uh, the household from from cobras in, in, in this area that is quite common. So mongoose fight cobras, but not parrots. Peacocks may, if they're male peacocks, attack a cobra to protect their family, but not small green parrots. Uh, snake shamas fight cobras, but not small parrots. Everyone else, except for mongoose, peacocks and snake shamas, are deadly afraid of cobras because one bite, and if you're not fast enough to cut the flesh out immediately and throw it, which, which is painful, very painful. I don't know if I could do it. Uh, perhaps uh, I don't even want to think about this. <laughs> uh, 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 everyone is afraid of cobras. I hear that they can even spit at you and the, the venomous poison and you have lifelong damage. I've heard uh, when there was the a British rail a worker, uh, you know, coming on a cobra nest and finding this small, small cobra. The cobra bit him, the small cobra, in, in the thumb and he died two days later. Cobras are deadly. These type of cobras, at least, uh, are, they are dangerous. They are absolutely to be avoided. Uh, uh, and uh, no one messes with the cobra, everyone runs. But here there are four mm, parrots who clearly had some plan to protect me. When, uh, when these cobras, did, uh, sorry, when these parrots flew their relentless, uh, relentless attacks, the cobra was Dis disturbed and disoriented and that gave, gave me that two one minute or two minutes which I needed to first of all understand the situation then jump up and run for my dear life I left everything behind uh, except my my japa mala my, my meditational uh, aid uh, and I ran and ran and after, uh, I do not know, you know, you, you, during these moments you don't calculate, perhaps it was 100 meters, perhaps 150. Uh, I uh, looked around and I saw that the cobra had changed its course, it had, was no longer after me, it had now gone to the sacred mountain and they have their uh, holes there it's nice and warm because the stones are heated up and the cobras like this atmosphere now the more the moment the 
cobra turned, the screeching stopped, and the parrots again had become their normal little parrots uh, 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 selves. They were in the trees uh, singing their parrot songs <laughs> and being in the paradisical mood, not the mood of uh, uh, jet fighters. <laughs> Who had told the parrots? Who had changed their genetic programming so that uh, peaceful vegetarians became uh, dangerous uh, uh, threats to a, a cobra. It was clear to me at that time, it, it was clear in this noetic sense, that sense of inner knowing, uh, that I had been part of a divine plan. In the Gita, we find this verse, I'm seated in the hearts of all beings who are on, in the, on this body like in a machine of material energy and it is me in the heart of these beings who direct all the wanderings. For me at that moment it was clear uh, that this was some uh, thing divine. And I remembered a second instant that had happened perhaps two years earlier. I had been in a, a place across the river. It was a very, how do you say this? A desolate forest or a forsaken forest. There was no one uh, except for me uh, there. And I, but I did know that somewhere in this lonely forest, that's the word I was looking for, this lonely forest, there was a temple which held at that time a specific significance for me. It was the temple of Lakshmi Devi, the eternal consort of uh, Vishnu. Uh, I had tried in previous years to find that temple, but uh, I had not been successful. So I had uh, decided I will somehow try to find this temple, uh, but I had no clue where it could be. So I went into an ashram, I said it was a lonely forest, uh, uh, that's correct, but in the forest there were two or perhaps three uh, ashrams by very reclusive monks whom you usually don't see interacting with society. So I had gone to one of these ashrams and I had sat uh, there uh, to do my japa meditation and all of a sudden the atmosphere changed and again a parrot came, small parrot, they are very small. Uh, the parrot landed on my shoulder and I thought nice, he's welcome and continued to chant, then it went on the other shoulder. I chanted, then it jumped into my lap. I continued. By that time, a monk came and watched the behavior of the parrot, who then jumped again up to the shoulder, then to the other shoulder, to the lap, he did the circle, so to say, and he felt there was something, so he asked, Yantra? Yantra, is there some magic going on? Tantra? Is there some Tantra going on? 
And I, I was not sure what was going on, but I responded, mantra, the, the magic of the mantra unfolds and uh, the parrot seems to be attracted. But then I noted something, the parrot wanted, had a message for me. It kept on uh, changing shoulders. It did not jump any longer down. And finally it stayed on one shoulder and started to grab my ear. Well, I, I thought, well, they're pleasant beings. Uh, I don't mind, uh, but, but why is he grabbing my ear? And the pull became stronger. Then I got an idea. I jumped up, uh, not jumped, I got up and I started to move in one direction to the gate of that ashram. I moved out and when I, at the moment I moved out, the parrot was on my other shoulder and pulled me here. So I decided, let me try to go along and see how this unfolds. So he pulled me and he was peaceful as long as, as I went in this direction. Then I consciously turned around and went in the other direction. And again, he was on the shoulder. And, no, that's not how, where we are going. <laughs> and uh, uh, pulled me and gave me a sign to continue my progress. So this parrot, uh, knew the map, he, by jumping here and there, pulling me here, pulling me there, uh, uh, he gradually brought me a long, long way until finally I was before the Lakshmi temple, which I had tried to find in the last year, and uh, uh, which I always wanted to find. And um, the moment I went into the temple, the parrot gave a very uh, loud in the ear and uh, blew away. I know that if I tell this to people, they think, wow, phew. Uh, this sounds mystical. But it was more. It was not just an uh, unexplainable phenomena. This uh, two examples were uh, first a sign that yes, I hear you chanting. I'm with you in your dry moments. I mm, uh, can understand that you are doubting my existence. Uh, but I will now show you uh, a sign that I care. And then the parrots were directed to uh, attack the cobra and save me from its uh, certain uh, deadly bite. And the second was again uh, a sign uh, how the Lord uh, had uh, empowered that or sent that parrot who then brought me to a place that was of deep spiritual significant significance for me. My dear everyone, C.G. Jung uh, has a word for when something happens outside um, in the outside world that has deep, deep meaning for you. Uh, he calls this a synchronicity. You are thinking something and then uh, people say something, do something, give you something that is directly connected with your train of thoughts. You think, wow, this was no accident. 
But what I'm talking about here is something different. Uh, I have often thought about it. It was that I was in a state where I uh, desired an answer and then an answer was given to me uh, in a way that uh, filled me with an inner knowing, a certitude, a wisdom that yes, I have been guided and protected. Uh, and uh, uh, these type of spiritual experiences I can mm, imagine are very, very uh, uh, doable or doable an experience is not doable. They are very much in the experience of all of us. They are uh, possible for all of us. Mm. Uh, there is a very interesting dialogue. Um, one student asked his master, O oh, Venerable Master, what can I do to make myself enlightened? And the Master answers, as much as you can do to make the sun rise. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> can any one of us make the sun rise? No. As much as you can do to make the sun rise. Then the student asks back, but Master, why then are you giving me, giving us so many spiritual practices? Why are you explaining uh, so many teachings? Why are you guiding us um, if, there is, if all this uh, amounts to nothing um, uh, in the sense that it does not influ can bring about a spiritual enlightenment? And the Master answers, answers, listen very carefully. I'm giving you these practices so that when the sun rises, you're not sleeping. So spiritual practices cannot uh, bring about the sunrise of a genuine spiritual experience where you can feel the Divine Presence. But spiritual practices are not without any value. They have value in that they prepare our consciousness so that we can perceive the Divinity and His wonderful, miraculous working all around us. Uh, my dear friends, I have often asked myself, mm, what was this experience when the parrots saved me from the deadly cobra? And for me, I, it's difficult to put it in words, but I really at that moment saw the, with a sense of inner knowing that uh, the one who is the great weaver of our existence, uh, who is behind this cosmic mm, universe, had uh, somehow mm, mm, arranged uh, that uh, an insignificant person asking for a divine sign <laughs> uh, got it in the way he could understand it uh, and he could receive it. I, uh, uh, needless to say that after uh, especially the first experience, you know, when, when I had asked for the sign and that the, cobra, the, the parrots protected me from that cobra, uh, totally, what is the word, atypical, not typical to their species. I, I sat down under my tree where I had started my meditation and uh, for a moment it seemed to me that the time stopped 
under the tree and in that area. The leaves of the tree were somewhat more of a translucent color. They were very, I think you would say also, I'm struggling for words because it's very difficult to express. Fluorescent, fluorescent, a shining uh, quality which was there all of a sudden and a peaceful atmosphere as if God had just walked uh, by and touched the whole of creation, parrots, cobras and me uh, with his divine presence and I just could revel uh, or, or stay, I was just staying in that uh, atmosphere uh, which after some time, perhaps half an hour or so, mm, faded uh, away and I uh, was just uh, grateful. And everything changed afterwards. I told you I had been uh, first fighting with the monkeys outside, then with my monkey mind inside the head. I was now uh, uh, doing my spiritual practice from a place of gratitude, of being truly moved in the head, in the, in the heart, and being uh, uh, very convinced and very inspired. <laughs> Good. I will now look at the time. I have a little time here on this uh, thing. Yes, we have 10 more minutes for questions and answers. I am done. I see a few smiling faces. <laughs> uh, maybe you could stay for a moment in that place in the Govardhan, uh, near the Govardhan mountain and feel uh, the, the walking, the passing by of a divine, whew, divine presence. Are there any questions? Thank you, such an anonymous Swami. We'll go to Amit. Thank you. Uh, what is the root cause of dry practice? And in those moments, what is the best means to remain patient? For that sunrise. Thank you, Amit. I can see you, uh, and I can see, see in your face that this is an important, if not even an existential question for you. Mm. When these dry faces come, it's best you give or let go of what we could call spiritual control. I will explain what that is. Very often we think that our spiritual practices are bringing about uh, a spiritual re realization. We, it's so deeply ingrained in our psychology because we know when we do something like uh, eating, uh, our hunger abates and we get strength in the body. Uh, we uh, so much work in this world with this cause and effect uh, methodology that we think it should also work in the spiritual field. I'm doing something or I'm trying to adopt a certain mood and then there should be uh, a sign and so on. But uh, that's not how, th that's not the traffic rules of the world of the spirit. <laughs> that's the rules of this world. Uh, at that time, uh, you can sincerely uh, put the things aside. You can say, I can see it, uh, it does not work and you can turn. Uh, to the one, uh, the, the one whom you are worshipping 
uh, and sincerely asked him to be present. I think the first uh, st uh, level of spiritual life is when you uh, are uh, adopting a spiritual practice and after some time you become a little bit uh, expert in it or familiar with the practice. The second stage is uh, when you do your spiritual practice uh, but you notice that the spiritual practice does not always bring the desired results. At that time, the second level, you just try harder. You speak with someone uh, who knows better than you, uh, get tips how you can improve your practice, but then uh, it may happen um, that nothing happens and you feel even more dry. Then comes the third level. And that third level is the level when you give up control uh, and uh, you uh, develop something like uh, spiritual patience. Uh, you go on with your practice uh, irregardless uh, whether results come or not. And in that state, Amit, where you are, um, where you have renounced doership, where you have renounced control, where you have even renounced expectations, so much can be given because finally you are no longer in the way. Finally, finally. Our problem in spiritual life is we are in the way of genuine experiences. So by surrendering, by giving up, uh, and by, uh, uh, how do you say, yes, submitting ourselves to a higher power, at that time everything happens. There's a song in our tradition, uh, in the Shara Nagati, where a question is asked, to whose prayer does Krishna, the son of Nanda, listen? And you think, what a question. He, he listens to everyone's question. Uh, prayers, sorry. So the question uh, sounds strange. To whose prayer, uh, prayers does he listen? And then the answer is given to that person. Um, well, Lord listens, who is practicing surrender. Let go and let it go. It's not easy. And Amit, if it becomes too strenuous, if the dry faces are too long, longer than you feel you can deal with them, I have a tip for you. Go into the association of uh, convinced spiritualists. That association, that atmosphere uh, can pacify your soul and it can carry you on. Even by going to an online program, this may happen. <laughs> I thank you, Amit, for asking such a, uh, let us say, important question, which I feel is uh, very relevant for us and in this way, not being afraid of being vulnerable. That is a necessary and genuine spiritual discussion. Thank you very much. So, I think it will be good to actually close here. And for those who can stay after, we invite you to do so. Sachinandana Swami, are you okay with that? Yeah, uh, I am. The, the thing is, today is, uh, I didn't want to miss this day. Today is Ram, Ram Chandra's uh, appearance day, and I'm here at the at a castle. And this is not like the monkey castle in India. It's a ooh, very developed castle, uh, and I'm, I'm, I have to give an online program. Uh, uh, which requires me, 
I, I could stay to 15 minutes after. Uh, uh, oh, I, I'm just getting, uh, my manager uh, says, I have 20 more minutes now. Mm -hmm. 20 more minutes. Thank you very much. And we're so appreciative that you're with us on that sacred appearance day of Lord Ram. Uh, thank you very much. So everyone who has who has to go now, you're welcome to to leave, but please come join us again next week. Thank you so much for being with us. We'll have a brand new episode of brand new spiritual experience of Sachinamana Swami and his helping us to internalize the import for ourselves next week. And again, do watch last week's episode if you have not already or if you haven't seen the Q&A. And for those who can stay with us, please do so. We'll go uh, until 1.15 Eastern time or whatever Sachinandana Swami can spare for us. Thank you very much. And now the next question is from Patsy. Hi, uh, Sachinandana Swamiji. Uh, so this is Patsy. Uh, I met you last year. So my um, question is uh, from integrating your teaching from last week. Uh, I remember you started out by saying the act of uh, displaying spiritual advancement will cancel uh, your achievement. So what came to mind was uh, generally uh, spiritual teachers must display their knowledge by sharing them. Because uh, I was leading a meditation class like shortly after uh, your, your, your session. So I was wondering like, hmm, how can I, uh, or how can in general a spiritual teacher teach without canceling their own effort? So I'd like some advice on that. Yeah. Thank you, Patsy. Patsy, I do remember you uh, from last year. Uh, thank you for coming again. Uh, what I wanted to express is that when a spiritual uh, teacher um, brings uh, his own deepest realization uh, out of his own heart, uh, he must be very careful uh, there, are, there is, but still he has to do it. So there is a right way and there's a wrong way. Let us go to the wrong way first. When a spiritual person uh, shares their spiritual experience to perhaps uh, build up their own ego, their sense of self-importance uh, in the hopes that he will uh, get uh, paid back in the coin of uh, admiration. Ah, oh, Patsy, you're doing so well. Oh, Sachinandan Swami, wow, you are so advanced. If, if that, uh, uh, let us say, uh, hunger is the motivation, the hunger for uh, admiration, uh, adoration, um, uh, fame, and so on, uh, he will uh, short trade, he will trade away his spiritual achievements uh, for these temporary benefits, admiration, adoration, and so on. A spiritual teacher who is hungry uh, for the admiration of others is uh, not yet uh, successful in conquering his ever hung, hungry ego. And uh, uh, if you feed the ego, that will become big and not uh, the, the spiritual uh, side, you know, not, not your spiritual uh, self, not the real you. You have to distinguish really. So the good way is if you in the mood of serving others spiritual advancement uh, share with them your sp uh, own uh, spiritual insights 
not for the purpose of um, becoming adored or appreciated or admired, but for the purpose to, uh, to serve others, then uh, it is uh, the right way. Now, between the two is a fine way, fine line. Uh, uh, and uh, I sincerely believe you only can know uh, how to walk this uh, path without stumbling into the wrong uh, way by trying again and again and again and again and then you will not cross that line uh, yes yes and a, and a, and a follow-up questions uh, will praise from others affect uh now, how do you manage praise from others and not to feed into the ego? I found that to be very difficult. Like, I wish yeah. people want praise at all, but they do. Yeah. yeah. I think it is normal in this world that we all like to be appreciated and not hated. <laughs> Isn't it? Oh, no, not dismissed, but... Uh, there is a very interesting scripture about uh, a verse in a scripture which uh, deals with how to deal uh, with praise effectively without becoming drowned by it in the false ego. It is said, praise is a cup of nectar when you give it to your own teacher. And it is a cup of poison when you drink it yourself. <laughs> what, what this means is uh, that as people praise you for or, or are grateful for you, to you, then internally you think, I am just uh, repeating uh, the gifts that were given to me. You may not say it in words, because sometimes people are just so grateful. And if you then say, oh, no, I'm nothing. My teacher is everything. It's almost like you're spoiling the uh, the atmosphere, you know, uh, and you don't uh, acknowledge, uh, but dismiss the sincere admiration. But in your mind, internally, uh, you should know, I'm just repeating, I'm on my way, I'm moving forward to my spiritual goal, I'm just repeating, I'm, as my spiritual master, he said, I'm just a postman, <laughs> I'm delivering what was uh, given, uh, you know, from someone else. So, Patsy, remain in the post-lady <laughs> situation or uh, mindset. That will be very good. <laughs> mm. Oh, thank you, Swamiji. And I want to, I'm eternally grateful for your words because uh, what I list, what I received from last year, it really carried me through uh, this year. And I was so surprised, uh, delightfully surprised that I, Get to be here with you and receiving thank you all right thank you very much and i'm just a postman <laughs> we'll call on naratam ah greetings and much uh please accept my humble obeisance since uh, uh swami sachinananda um, I'm, uh, I have a question, uh, how would you advise to use the principles of bhakti to support non-devotees who are in active distress, so people who are very close to us, who were in a state of suffering? Um, uh, so, you know, my desire, our desire is to want to help this person, or help these people who are close to us. Uh, but not necessarily are practicing and not really asking for help, but we just see the suffering this time. Yeah. 
I'm often in this situation and uh, I very strongly believe in prayers. I have made the best experiences with prayers. Now, they work best if the person who is suffering uh, wants uh, you to pray for, for them and their well-being. Um, if they don't want this, it can be kind of in, intrusive even uh, to pray for someone. But uh, if they are close to you, why shouldn't they want it? I would just uh, tell them that uh, perhaps it depends on how spiritually aware they are, but you can start with the the search which is there there are many many good established studies which show that uh, patients cancer patients for whom uh, prayers were said uh, could uh, be much better cured than uh, patients for whom prayers were not said so th this the study which I'm aware of had uh, a third group also. First group is people who knew and wanted that prayers were spoken for them. The second group was uh, people who, for whom no prayers were spoken uh, and who had not inquired. And the third group was a group uh, for whom prayers were spoken, but they did not know. They were not informed uh, of this experiment and they did not know it. I, we can think about the ethical uh, dimension of this uh, at a different time, perhaps. I'm just saying I'm aware of a study which had these three groups and the, the result was for those who knew their prayers were said for them, and they wanted it, recovery was very dramatically better than the group for whom no prayers were said. Now, uh, uh, astonishing for the researchers was that even the third group for whom prayers were said without their knowledge, they had a very uh, statistically significant uh, percentage of, of recoveries and so on. So um, I usually pray in a general way for the welfare of the world every Tuesday. I, I have this as my, I call it the Compassion Tuesday. I pray for those who are uh, the victims of aggression and for those who are aggressors. Uh, you know, I pray for these uh, people in a general way. But when I pray in a specific way, I usually will ask that the person is, uh, 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 I will find out if the person wants this. I somehow feel uh, general prayers can be said for everyone without asking them, but specific prayers uh, should be said only to those who who wish this. This is my my own guideline. I have not. Uh, I'm not saying it is the only guideline, but uh, that's how I somehow feel in my heart. It should be done. So when they are close, you should do, and here is a good way to do. Now, please, everyone, listen very attentively, uh, because uh, I think everyone in our lifetime will come into the situation where they are either asked to pray for others or where they pray for others. So here it is. First of all, you should have a clear picture 
of the person you're praying for. How does he look? How old is he or she? Uh, and then what is their specific uh, situation? The disease, is it a disease? Is it an accident? What, what type of accident was a leg broken or a hip broken or, you know, specific? Uh, what is uh, the, the situation? Then, after bringing the person you pray for and his or her situation into your mind, the second step needs to be done. Bring this situation to uh, that uh, divinity, that supreme being, uh, Lord, uh, whom you worship, and, and bring it almost before, uh, uh, bring that person and the situation before him, or as if you bring it in, in the room, in the audience room, if you so want, or audience hall, um, and so on. Uh, invoke, in other words, the divine presence. Uh, and then the third step is ask uh, the divinity to shower his mercy in whatever way he uh, feels appropriate or fit. Mm. That uh, leaves uh, God the space which he needs to do his miracle when you asked him uh, to shower his uh, healing energy or in a way he feels uh, appropriate. And such prayers, Narutama, I think you are an Ayurvedic practitioner, isn't it? Isn't it? Was it? Or do I have it right? I'm a, a Western medical doctor. I'm a psychiatry, psychiatrist. Acha, psychiatrist. Uh, then I have, mm, I mistook you for someone else. Uh, mm, this simple method, I call it the uh, healing triad. No, the person, God, and uh, 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 and your particular prayer. Oof! It has done so much. Uh, I have. Uh, I, I'm very, very convinced of it. I have miraculous healing. People have almost uh, come uh, f from from their deathbed into uh, the uh, on the surfing board. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it has really done a lot. You need to create a triangle. You are there, the person in this situation. And God, these are the three. Good. If I could ask one follow-up. Um, Please. In terms of just karma and kind of, you know, it, how, do, how do we avoid the request feeling transactional? Like we're, uh, you know, so I, I like what you said about we're going to, you know, just ask for it you know, divine, you know, for Krishna to, to show us divine, you know, show divine mercy, you know, with this situation. So um, not looking for that, uh, I guess, that direct healing of, you know, cure, cure them, I guess. But uh, still we're asking for, even for another, we're still asking for something. And it, you know, it has that a little bit of that feeling of, um not letting go of the expectation of the request. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your very, uh, let us say, relevant question here. Yeah, I always feel we need to respect that, uh, that there is maybe a superior plan for the patient, for the person. And we need to, uh, we don't want to cross that by a very specific request. Um, but see, healing can take place in two ways. It doesn't have to be, let us say, that someone has a broken arm and now the broken arm is again straight and in perfect working order. It could also be the healing that the person will have the inner strength to deal 
with a broken arm or whatever situation is there. So therefore, mm, uh, you can leave it a little bit open in which way the help is uh, going to be given. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. It was such Thank a pleasure you. to share this time with you and all these devotees. Thank you. That's unanimous, Swami. Do we need to let you go? Yes, I'm. I'm. I'm just looking at my wristwatch here. Uh, I want to say thank you to all of you. This is very important to me. I'm very motivated to show up. Uh, uh, and uh, I have already prepared something very, very different from the previous episodes for the next one. And uh, I want to leave you with a thought. Mm. Uh, Yes, we cannot make these divine experiences uh, uh, happen. Yes, we cannot do anything to become enlightened, so to say. <laughs> but we can make sure that we create a space in which this is more possible, this divine inspiration. L like the wise Master told his student, I'm telling you all these practices to make sure that you are not asleep when the sun rises. <laughs> all right, so I will have to go. May I ask you, our uh, respected host, to, uh, to let me go. I don't know how to, you, you know, I'm not so good with computer. I can only uh, uh, do this uh, simple near this this process I only know. Goodbye everyone and see you soon again. <laughs> Bye everyone. Thank you to everyone for coming. Such a gift to have you with us. See you next week. Uh, thank you for making this. And uh, Harry, can I ask you a quick question? Do you do you are you not aware of? Do you have a button that you can mute all participants up on entry? Uh, thank you. Yes, yes, we will look into that. That's very, yeah. very, very helpful. Yeah, it's right. It's a, there's a three three dots right underneath the participant window, and then you can check that. And then people would be automatically muted. Wonderful. Thank you, Patsy. Bye. Bye, Patsy.